Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great panel discussion on tap for you. I am so very excited about today's event and the lineup of speakers we have. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for all of us or any of the speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use that question and answer tab and get your question in. We'll be moderating those questions throughout the webinar. So uh, we'll probably address your question at some point during the conversation. And we also have a very interactive chat feature we do encourage you to use. Please send us your questions, comments, suggestions, whatever you want to share with us. We'll be more than happy to take a look at it in the chat box, and we may even incorporate it into our conversation. And finally, at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is the state of DevSecOps application security. And I have an amazing lineup of speakers on today's webinar uh, going to be uh, pro providing us their thoughts and expertise on DevSecOps and, uh, you know, and, and just kind of give us the lay of the land and so much more. Uh, but our, our to introduce all of them, first of all, we have Mira Rao, who is the Senior Director of Product Management for DevOps Solutions at Synopsys. Welcome, Mira. Thanks for joining me. Hello, everyone. Okay, good. I also have Rob Cuddy, who is the Application Security Sales Evangelist over at HCL Software. Hey, Rob, thanks for being here. Yeah, hey, Charlene, great to be here. Thanks, uh, looking forward to the discussion. Excellent, excellent, me too. Next up, we have Scott Gerlach, who is the co-founder and chief security officer over at Stackhawk and uh, gets the gold medal for the best t-shirt of the webinar. So Scott, thanks <laughs> yes. for joining. Thanks, Charlene. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. Next up, we have Dave Muir, Dave Muir who is the uh, global principal solutions architect for security ISVs over at Red Hat. Dave, as always, a pleasure to see you again. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Charlene. Looking forward to it. All right. And last but certainly not least, we have Sheree it Arad Itsan, who is the Director of Product over at Whitesource. Sheree, thanks so much for being a part of today's presentation. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. So uh, as you can tell uh, by the uh, by the titles and the companies that these folks really know their stuff when it comes to DevSecOps, and we're approaching DevSecOps from so many different angles. Uh, and, and uh, different technologies. Application security is a tough one uh, for so many organizations these days. DevSecOps is, is tough for so many organizations these days. And we're gonna try and dig in a little bit and find out what's, what's holding organizations back when it comes to DevSecOps. What are the obstacles that they're facing? What are some of the reasons why DevSecOps is so hard for so organizations? And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll uncover some insights that you will be able to use in your organization. But I want to kick things off by just maybe taking a look at the lay of the land, if you will, um, just to understanding where we are with respect to application security. And uh, because we do have five panelists, I, I'd like to kind of ask Rob to kind of kick off the conversation here and then ask um, and anybody uh, else on our panel who wants to contribute, please please feel free to. Uh, but Rob, why don't you go ahead and get us started off? You know, where are we today with respect to application security? Well, yeah, and, and I love the fact that it's becoming so prevalent. So the, the thing I'm seeing with application security is this raised awareness. And what's interesting to me is how much it's become a paramount kind of discipline in making things work. And, and what kind of drives it home for me is actually, um, I'll take me back to my childhood just a little bit. If you guys remember back in 1980, there was a movie released called Raiders of the Lost Ark. And in the opening scene of that movie, right, you see 
Indiana Jones go through this pyramid and all these different sequences of traps and get to an idol. And he does the classic little sandbag balance thing and grabs the idol. And then he gets all the way out, re, you know, going back through all of those things. And the point of that to me is he got out, right? So there were all these layers, all these things in place to prevent it. But at the end of the day, he was able to take that idol and run out with it. And we know what happens after, you know, he gets that gets stolen. But the point being that that's what's going on with applications, right? Traditionally, we had all these things there to kind of prevent stuff from getting stolen. Well, today people can go right to the app and they can take right from the application itself. And so instead of just looking at this outside in, protect the perimeter, assume everything is okay, we have to look inside out. And that means understanding from a requirement standpoint and a design standpoint and tracing that all the way through. Um, so what I see going on are people who go, yeah, we, we want to do this, but we don't know how and we haven't really been taught. And so there's a movement at the university level to say, how do we get secure coding in? And there's a movement to say, how do we make threat modeling relevant to developers at a level that they can understand? How do we do security requirements in the same way we do, you know, defect tickets and enhancements and all of that kind of stuff? And then, oh, by the way, we have this massively ever increasing threat landscape that's now introduced containers and microservers and Kubernetes, you know, oh my, right? So there's all of that kind of stuff going on. And, and Dave, I know you've got some thoughts there as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about Raiders of the Lost Ark, actually. I'm yeah, John, John, exactly. John, I love that movie. I know. It takes us back a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, exactly. And um, the, the way I've seen it over the last couple of years specifically is, you know, in terms of risk, right? And, and you right. mentioned at the perimeter, but in application risk, um, and it's and it's for a while. It's all it's been about vulnerabilities. How vulnerable is your application, as well as secrets? Make sure your secrets aren't in GitHub or wherever. So those have kind of been the two main items that people would think about. What's interesting about Kubernetes and containers is that configuration information has become sort of the top of the list for a risk, you know, vector or attack vector that uh, that um, you know the bad actors are looking at. So. Um, you're making sure that your configurations are secure is also now part of something that uh, developers and folks need to need to take care of. And that sort of is backed up by a report Red Hat did earlier this year in the state of Kubernetes adoption, where it said the top you know, issue, the top um, uh, problem in security with Kubernetes is, is misconfigurations. Right. Well, in the recent OWASP top 10 that came out just a couple months ago, right, security misconfigurations being one of the categories that was added in. And I think we're all glad to see that, yeah. you know, realize like, yeah, it's not just the code. It's it's what you're putting it into and how you're how you're creating that space. So, yeah, a ton going on there. So if I may add, one of the biggest challenges I saw over the past, like this is my 15th year being in the application security space and working with customers is most organizations assume that when I go buy a tool for every activity that we ask them to do in their STLC, that is it, right? So they don't realize that they need to build this culture within the organization and the people play a very key part. Right, whether it's the developers, whether it's the operations team, whether it is the information security team or your compliance team, um, or the people who are doing threat modeling or architecture risk analysis, right? So I I, I feel that not able to uh, bring that culture within the organization has been the biggest challenge, even though we have tools for every aspect, right? Whether you want to scan containers, whether you want to do cloud configuration review, whether you want to do SAST, SCA, DAST, we have great tools out there, but then I don't see that culture being built within the organization to make sure that everyone works together. I think that is the biggest challenge I have been seeing in the industry. Hmm. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. So if we think of like, you know, application security, applications have changed so much in the last few years, right? We're moving from, you know, a traditional application and maybe the highest risk was my proprietary code and there was a lot of money spent on network security to a completely different world, right? We spoke about infrastructure as code, so it's Kubernetes, but it's also... Terraform and Puppet and now GitOps that is, you know, raising. So applications are just becoming more and more complex. And therefore, the security of those applications is also becoming a lot more complex and needs to have more expertise. Also, we're shifting from a world of like IT, right, where you know, we had IT and they managed the network and they managed the application and they managed the secrets. And it was more about, you know, the infrastructure technology to a world of developers and DevOps. So a lot of the traditional IT job is now moving to the engineering, like the mm -hmm. developers, the DevOps. And that right. also is a very big change in terms of, you know, the mindset, also the culture that we need to, we need to shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very, very much so. I think the one other thing that you, you just said, Sue, that kind of hit it about the shifting is where, where I'm seeing so much of the intersection is around privacy. And so how privacy and security have to go together. And for most folks, that's the place where it becomes real. So I have two adult children now, but it, it always astonishes me when they look at, you know, applications that they're using or they want to Venmo money or whatever. And they, they just assume security is coming along for the ride. And so there's this whole notion of, yeah, I'm going to trade privacy for convenience and, and, you know, assume that somebody on the back end is doing the right thing. And so for us, you know, we, we know that there has to be controls in place. There have to be things done to protect that data. And, and I think that's where that intersection, the rubber meets the road, you know, in this place. You know, it's an interesting point that you bring up, Rob, about uh, the, just the, the user automatically assuming that things are going to be secure and, and that folks are going to do the right thing. And so, I think that in and of itself is, has kind of put the onus on or organizations and, and companies to uh, to really develop uh, software that is much more secure by design. And mm -hmm. I say that because uh, w you know when you take the pulse of you know your average user, their level of cybersecurity knowledge is super super low, and uh, and it it always astonishes me how how little awareness folks have around cybersecurity in general. Maybe because we're in the space, we see it a lot more, we know it a lot better than your average Joe or Jane or whatever. Uh, right. But it, it, you know, because there is that uh, that that dearth of understanding around security issues with applications uh, I, I think that uh, companies are you know they're they're recognizing now that they're the ones who really have to uh, make sure that their applications are secure because you know there there are just too many factors out there that are are you know that are threats to their organization and to that data so um, right. but uh, but you know your, your point about, you know, the users just kind of assuming that uh, security is going to be there, I, I think is a very, very valid point. Yeah. And I, I think trust is becoming um, kind of a business commodity too, right? So wanting to be able to tell people, hey, you're, you're safe with us, right? We handle your data properly. I think that's going to start to win out more and more in the marketplace. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Scott, we haven't heard from you. What's uh, yeah. what are you? What's your thought? Yeah, I feel like we're making some grand assumptions about users here, and <laughs> the, the assumption is that they're thinking about security at all. Like, <laughs> yes, that's a we, good one. <laughs> we do a good job of going like security, 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 and then we do a terrible job of translating that into people language, as security industry and security practitioners, and people just don't think about it. They're like, "What? Oh, security nerds are talking." got to go. Um, so the, the assumption that people are even thinking about this as a user, um, I think is a little, a little bit of an elevated thing that they just are looking for services. And 
uh, things that make their life easier. They're not going, I, I want to be able to send money to someone. I hope Venmo has done a lot of threat modeling in the application design and architecture phase. They're not doing that. They're just going, right. I just want to send money. Yep. Um, right. And so people that, that I think companies and products and services that are making people's life easier will win out. Those things that are doing that the right way, uh, security is a feature, speed's a feature, quality is a feature. Those features show up in a different way. And that's quality of service, speed of service, yep. uh, those kinds of things. So, you know, I, I think of it a different way uh, when you when we talk about what people are thinking about. Now, obviously, business to business is a little bit different because there's security teams and policy teams that are reviewing security activities, et cetera, and making decisions based on that. But if you're talking about end users, and a little bit of this flows down to developers, right? Uh, if you're talking about end users, they're like, this is not the top of their head. If you're talking about developers, this is not top of their head because it's like this whole other thing yep. that we're doing a bad job translating for them. Yeah, I, yeah. I was about to say the same thing. Like developers are very similar to users, right? Because you're telling them security, they're like, mm, yeah, okay, yeah, I can go through this security training if I have to, but it's not something that really, really bothers them. Again, I'm generalizing here, but it's something that we're starting to see the awareness in the recent years. Um, most of the developers don't want to be security experts, right? right. If, if you can... Uh, do this for them, they'll be happier. Uh, then they have to work for security. They have to, they have to upgrade the versions. They have to scan their code. Um, so it, I really need to think that in terms of like DevSecOps, application security, and just security organizations in general, we as we make the lives easier for the end user, we need to make developers' life easier when it comes to security. Um, right. And I think that when you, when you know, R and D organizations think of what's the right tool for me, what's the right security tool, um, they sometimes prefer ease of use and like it's easy to implement uh, over other things. And we, as you know, we need to be aware of that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, Shiri, I, I was a former developer, so I, I take a little bit of issue of what you said. <laughs> uh -oh. Actually, no, I don't. You're absolutely oh, no. correct. Go ahead. Absolutely you, right. are, yeah. you are spot on. When I was a developer, I didn't care about security. I cared when I got a spreadsheet from the security team saying that my app was, that I built like a year ago, and it's been in production forever, that my app yeah. is vulnerable, <laughs> and I have to fix it. And then they gave me two pieces of information that I couldn't connect the dots with, right? So that was, I would say though, that was you know a long time ago, about 10, 15 years ago. Now I think with DevOps, DevSecOps, things are shifting left a little bit. Uh, we're always um, you know preaching uh, train developers. You can't train a developer to be a security professional, but you can give them some high level training so that they're aware and uh, they're starting to do more secure coding. They still don't care about security, but they do care, especially if you're in a real DevOps practice where you're a SRE, a site reliability engineer, and the code that you put in production, you're on call for. So once right. you have that accountability, then you start caring. But you're right yeah. um, on your point. Yeah, yeah, I think you're spot on there too, because it's a it's the collaboration piece, right? So to to what Scott was talking about before with the the users, I remember going around Black Hat a couple of years ago and everybody saying, hey, we got to get developers doing security. In the back of my mind, I'm going, well, good luck with that, right? Because if they wanted to be a security expert, they would be. Um, they don't. And, and the flaw in the logic is that if we point out a security vulnerability to a developer, they're going to know how to fix it. And I think we've discovered that that's just not true, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's like what you just said, Dave, connecting the dots. And so I think the bigger thing is now how do we get these teams working together to not just point out the flaws, but actually get to remediation. So, yeah, I, I so don't know I, if that's true, Rob. Sorry. Uh, Charlene, if we need to move on, we can. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I was, I was actually going to say, I do, I do want to discuss uh, who actually, who owns application security. 
But we've gotten a couple actually questions and comments in that I thought might be interesting for us to address real quick. First of all, Eric says many or most employees think security is an IT problem and don't consider the business impact. And how often do security teams really understand the business impact of the vulnerabilities and exploits being chased? And I think that's a very, very valid point because uh, you know there, there needs to be a business conversation around security in general. And, uh, and when you get everybody on the same page, then I, I, it seems to me, based on what, you know, what, I've, what I've seen, what I've heard, what's been going on, that once that business conversation occurs and everybody understands what the impact is to not only to their, their users, but also to the business at large, mm -hmm. the conversation becomes a lot easier uh, between developers and security personnel. So you know, how, how much when we're talking about uh, ownership of application security, is it a developers versus security people or is it a, uh, is it a kind of a, an, an even split between the two of them or, you know, does somebody else within the organization that, that isn't necessarily in charge of application development or security coming in and having that business conversation. So it's kind of more like a three you know, uh, d d evenly divided in into like three parts uh, ownership. And um, Mira, I want to I want to actually start with you on this one because of your you know your experience, and uh, I, I think you kind of I, I think you I agree on the business conversation. I hope so. At least. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> no, I think having worked with like several uh, clients, or like I said, over the past almost fourteen years. We have seen that shifting, right? Earlier, it was just the security analysts uh, who owned the tools and then who also were responsible for performing all the security activities, right? So they knew what the business risk was and they classified those uh, vulnerabilities, however they found it, using tools or penetration testing or manual code review, and then we're able to influence the development teams that you need to fix this. But over the past few years, we have seen that change a little bit, not too much, right? These security analysts are still part of the scrum meetings now because that is where they are able to influence saying, hey, I have a SQL injection. This is a business critical application. We need to make sure that we prioritize this, fix this. Uh, no matter how many days exception do you get, right? Because we all go through that exception process. So we are seeing that even though the development teams don't own it anywhere, I haven't seen them own uh, security tools or security activities, but the security analysts or the application security team or the SSG, whatever they may call, are part of the, the development process, right? So they are able to influence, they are able to participate in the scrum meetings, and then influence the, the, the uh, remediation. Uh, and then we are also seeing a lot of shift of bringing in those security champions. Every uh, uh, group has a security champion who is not completely uh, uh, proficient about application security, but at least knows when he or she or they look at issues coming out of tools and then prioritize them so that they can be part of that process, right? So we are seeing a small shift. We, are, we still are not seeing the level of ownership that the development teams should take, that they are taking, but then it is a slight change that is happening. So you cannot say uh, in an industry that the development teams own security. That still hasn't happened. So the ownership still resides on the SSG, like whether it is providing exceptions or whether it is deciding what tools to uh, 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 include or whether it is deciding what are certain controls that are needed when exceptions are provided. So we are still seeing security teams having more control than the development teams. Yeah, it makes, makes a lot of sense. 
Scott, I, I apologize. I kind of interrupted you as, as we moved on. But what you know, what what do you think about this? Uh, you know, this this question of ownership with application security, because to me, it, it seems like it's a very difficult question for organizations for anybody really to answer. And I wonder, is it is it because of organ, organizational structures? Is it because of just you know, it's the way it's always been done, or is it something else altogether? I, I think it's. Like, obviously, there's this is a very complex subject uh, yeah. topic. I think there's a lot of things at play here. If you were to ask me who should own application security, the security team's involved if it exists. Like, if there's a security team, sure, they should be involved. They should be consultants yeah. on risk because that's their job. They're consultants on risk. Uh, the other people that should be owner super involved here are product and engineering teams. Like those are the people that are making decisions about what we build, when we build it, when we deliver it. And they should also be involved in what we fix, when we fix it, and when we deliver that fix. So uh, those things are hard. And I think by a large amount, what is happening here is uh, security teams aren't letting them do that. Hmm. And so what happens is we're like, hey, we want to gate, we want to make decisions, we want to and we're not letting those teams or giving those teams the freedom to go, hey, you guys should be looking for these kinds of tools. Find one that works for you in the way that you develop software, and I will come along with you. I, I have heard that so few times. It's I've heard it a couple of times, but so <laughs> few times. It's ridiculous because we're, we're trying to go, hey, here's the tool that I want you to use. And it doesn't match what they do as a business workflow at all guess what? They're not going to use it. So if we started as security leaders and application security teams started going, hey, I want you guys to find a thing that works for how you work. And here's yep. some structure around it. It should do something like this. Find one that works for you. I'll pay for it. I'll go along with you. I'll let you make decisions. I yep. will consult with you when you get stuck and we'll be a happy crew. I have seen a few uh, customers like that, Scott. They'll say, we, we will build for you a paved road. And then if you want to take a detour, yes. But then at the end of that, you need to make sure that there are no issues introduced. So right. I have seen very few customers. I can uh, count on my uh, fingertips, but there are. <laughs> I agree with you, Scott. Yeah. You know, it's it's fascinating to me, too, because it, it reminds me so much of what we've seen in the DevOps space when it comes to pushing code to production. Right. And if you go back, right, 10, 15 years, you had all the ops guys going, hey, the best way to ensure our systems stay up is don't change anything. And so you had all the gatekeeping going on and you had all of the right. We used to talk about, hey, I've never met a sysadmin who wants somebody pushing something into their environment. But then we started to introduce infrastructure as code and patterns and templates and production like environments. And and I'm wondering, Scott, do you, do you see the same kind of thing starting to happen in security now where there's that same need where security teams have to say, hey, look, we. We know the best way to you know, maintain our risk where it is right now is to not change anything, but we can't operate a business that way. So how do we allow people to do things safely so that we can consume it and trust it and allow it in and, and those kinds of things? I mean, it's, it's a different dynamic, but it feels like the same sort of culture problem. Yeah, I, it's absolutely the same kind of culture problem, right? It's If you think about how DevOps started, it was, I want to go faster at operations. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to people and DevSecOps here's my rant on DevSecOps. DevSecOps is like, <laughs> security, DevOps comes along and security is like, hey, we want to play too, right in the middle here, but we're going to do it the old way. Yeah. Um, but what we're not doing is going, hey, we need to change how we think here and let people make decisions and then consult on those decisions. Okay. So, you know, oftentimes when uh, we talk to, I've heard a lot of security people say this, hey, I don't want people to be able to make decisions on risk acceptance or false positivity stuff. And I'm like, okay, why not? Well, they'll yeah. make the wrong decision. And I go, but they're making a decision and documenting it. Isn't that mm -hmm. better than what you have now? And they kind of go, hmm, nope. I don't want people to make, right? That's that's bad habit that you're making there. <sighs> because what happens then is people go, yeah, I'm not doing this. I'm not participating because I can't self-serve. I can't make my decisions. 
they can be wrong as long as I document them. Right. That's okay. Right. Fine. That's better than where we are today. Um, yeah, that's how so, you learn. That's exactly how you learn. You learn in the context of what you're working on and you get highly reproducible things so that you do go, Hmm, this is interesting. I can actually replay this thing, start debugging and try to figure out what's going on here. If you can capture attention quickly at the time of writing code or at the time of build testing, all that good stuff, you have a really good chance of just fixing stuff and getting out of this loop of, Hey, we have to prioritize this fix because yeah. it's been out there for six, eight months, two years. Yeah. Right. right. So we got it. Sorry. Go the ahead. other thing I have seen is asking for auditing of all those logs when developers actually triage the results. This is exactly what Scott mentioned, right? Because they mark it as false positive and they want all the uh, uh, results there to see who marked it as false positive. So I think I think that is also the other piece, right? Like you're not giving the developers responsibility to own the security. We want that control, but then we also come back and say, they are not owning it. This is too much work for us. We are outnumbered. And that constant uh, back and forth has been going on. And that silos, which we were supposed to break, hasn't broken until now. Good point. And Jennifer actually put in the, the, the chat, you know, you are so right. One of our challenges is to get our security team to stop working in a silo. <laughs> if you guys have any any words, sage words of advice uh, to, to enable uh, Jennifer and her organization to, uh, to get security teams out of the, uh, working in a silo or any organization, I am sure you guys would like win a Nobel Prize or something, I think, because it just seems to be such a big issue among organizations. And to me, that seems to be one of the largest issues uh, in hindering DevSecOps adoption. Well, yeah, so you know, I think it's, it's all about, sorry. Yeah, it's all about the communication between the security and the developers, right? So at the end of the day, the security team will tell you, <coughs> okay, you have to fix these 15 vulnerabilities. And then the developer would go, well, maybe this one is a false positive. This one, well, I fixed it. This one I cannot fix because I cannot up upgrade the version. And then you have this feedback loop and this back and forth that Mia just uh, mentioned. And somehow the information is not flowing back to the to the security teams. Um, so I think this is one of the challenges, right? Closing this loop, um, making sure that we have very open communication between developers and security teams so that we can actually give them feedback. You know, this one is not a false positive or maybe we can mitigate it in another way, but you need to have this communication and this, you know, flowing information between um, the two departments. Yeah, and I, I was going to add that great point. I was going to add as well, this sort of goes back to what Scott was saying, his rant on DevSecOps, which I, which I agree, but I don't think that's my view of DevSecOps. I think that's security trying to be part of DevOps. And maybe security people were, were angry because they didn't get named in the whole DevOps movement. You know, and they still want to stay in their silo. But in my view, DevSecOps is having the security teams play the same roles as development and operations teams when you're doing that collaboration. So like Shri said, you know, and, and Mira mentioned this as well that she's seen, which I'm glad to hear, you start to see um, you or you want your security teams to be part of the conversations in development and operations in your DevOps. So just small things like invite them to your scrum meetings like Mira was saying, or invite them to your lunch and learn, right? <laughs> like, It is a big culture change and it, it takes a ton of, uh, of work and effort. But, um, but in my view, DevSecOps is making sure those security teams are involved, have a seat at the table and have the same shared goals that DevOps have. Like put, put their names next to some KPIs and, and have that accountability there. And I think you'll see some movement. Yep. Yeah, you're right, Dave. The, the one thing I always tell my security people when I'm like trying to get them up to speed on what's going on with the business, I make them do two things. One, go find an application team and sit in their scrum and don't say anything for a month. <laughs> figure out what they're working on. Figure out how you can help them solve problems and become a partner to that team. 
Yeah. And then iterate and grow out from there, but start with one team. And the yeah. other one is go listen to some sales calls to see what the business actually does and what value they're delivering to customers. Yep. Great yeah. point. I think, I think any, anybody in an organ an organization should do that. Um, it's very, very important to know what you're actually selling at the end of the day and what your customers are expecting. So yeah. I think it's, that's great, great advice. Listen, I want to shift the conversation a little bit, and I, I apologize because I know this is a very, very hot topic. But we, you know, there there are so many facets to DevSecOps and application security. I want to make sure that we hit the high points here. So uh, I want to shift to the uh, the very important topic of open source software and and uh, and uh, open source components, and uh, you know their role in the DevSecOps conversation and. Um, Dave, since you 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 work for Red Hat, you, you guys don't know anything really about open source, but you know, I thought yeah. maybe I'll just throw this one out to you and and see, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> when we're talking about DevSecOps and and open source, uh, you know, uh, can can they can they coexist peacefully? Um, you know, and where does where does open source kind of fit in the DevSecOps conversation? Yeah, it is, or a good vice question, versa. Right? It is odd you're asking the guy from Red Hat to talk about open source. So I was wondering yeah, about that. Know. But you know, total joke. Obviously, if folks don't know Red Hat, we're we're all about open source software, um, and and our products are based on open source software. But when you think about application security, I would say 15, 10, 15 years ago, um, this wasn't such a hot topic with applications for some reason or another. Then the SCA movement started. So SCA, Software Composition Analysis, aka Dependency Vulnerability Analysis, and um, and then things like Heartbleed happened and other named vulnerabilities on open source packages that were included in applications. And so a whole industry started around ensuring that, A, what you know, uh, that you do know what you know is in your applications, not only your proprietary code, but also the code that you bring in. Uh, and B, that you're monitoring that for security vulnerabilities. So open source software, in my view and in my experience over the last 10 years, has sort of flipped. It used to be all about the custom code that you wrote, and it still is, but open source software is now the majority of what's in applications. If you think about lines of code, uh, and just thinking about like Java apps or, or other Node.js apps, you include one package in Node.js, and you get like 150 other packages that you didn't even want uh, included in that package as well. And then on top of that, if you're working with containers, which you should be, um, you, you deploy your application on top of a Linux container, which is 100% open source. So that becomes a much larger problem, understanding all the package in that container, um, monitoring that open source for vulnerabilities, maybe licensing issues as well. But it, it becomes a pretty big complex problem and open source is sort of an understanding and managing that open source is pretty key. Makes sense. Um, anybody else? Uh, Shuri, you, you guys are working a lot with open source code also. So, uh, you know, what uh, what are your thoughts there? So again, we're, so Dave uh, already sort of summarized it, but I think that we are now in a world where around 80% of any application that's being written is actually open source, right? So if like 10 years ago, it was mostly proprietary code, then you can train your developers and you can do the security training and you can trust them that they are write, writing the best possible code with open source. This is not the same. And there is like constantly this debate of like, what's more secure, right? And should I invest more in uh, in you know, securing my proprietary code versus my open source code. So the good news is that open source has so many ways to actually secure itself, right? When you find a vulnerability in open source in like, I think 95% of the cases, it will already be solved in the next version. You have so many tools to do the automated scanning, even like very good free tools to do that. Um, Automatic remediation, right? Creating automated pull requests um, to constantly upgrade your um, dependencies is something that is becoming more and more popular. And at the end of the day, it is becoming easier 
to actually secure your open source component. So that's great news. And I think we have a very good progress there. So if I can add, yep. one of the challenges I have seen is a lot of uh, companies do those scannings for open source when they uh, allow it, right? So they, they say, this is a good open source component. You can start using it. And then they stop at that point, right? Like once you approve a open source component, doesn't mean that you never again scan it. So that is where I think I try to educate my customers saying, you have to make it part of your mm -hmm. CI, CD build so that you are able to scan it almost every single day, right? Because right. yes, today when you approved it and brought it in your organization, it was secure, but then you don't know when they will start saying that, hey, this has a vulnerability and the score is like eight or nine critical, right? So there needs to be an ongoing effort to scan those open source components on, on a regular basis. I think that is also another point that most companies miss, which is creating a lot of the problems in the world right now. Wow. That is, that's such a great point too. And, and I also find it funny because, you know, a lot of times when they're scanning open source dependencies, um, folks I talk to are, they're much more concerned about the license rights mm -hmm. than the security. And the bigger question is, is not, is it safe, but am I allowed to use it? Right. And, and so your point about just scanning that continually, it's like the, the one stop shop scan answers that second question about okay yeah the licenses I'm, I'm fine but but the whole safety issue you know bubbling up um and i think this fits into the whole software bill of materials conversation too yeah, where everybody's you, coming in right <laughs> where it's just like you know if you don't know what you have then it's really hard to secure it right and it's and, and we know lots of examples around that one but so yeah yeah so what about vulnerabilities that show up in open source after your application has been uh, has has been put out to production? Um, you know, is, is there ever going to be like an, a, a good way to, to solve that? Because obviously that is uh, that's happened before and uh, it's probably uh, one of the, the most prevalent uh, issues, I think, that we face when we're using open source components. So how do you get a handle on that? I, I love to think about this a little bit differently. I like to, you know, lots of people here have said 80% of the application that you write is now open source. Think of how much awesome code review you're getting from that open source because it's open source at this point. So all of that code is being reviewed by lots more eyes than the stuff that you're writing already. So that is super awesome. The versioning dependency stuff is now the thing that you have to be really good at and pay attention to. And there's lots of great tools out there that make that alert of, hey, there's a new version of this thing uh, available. Make that available and make it easy to do. The tricky part here is like, if I upgrade that thing, is it gonna break the app? Yeah. And how do, I, how do I get back to fixing that? Mm -hmm. But I like to think about it like that, like, it's so awesome that we get to use this a lot of eyeballs on code from open source communities that have security researchers and all kinds of people looking at it and trying to figure out if there's problems in it and making the whole ecosystem a lot bigger. Uh, obviously, that second part is really, really important then. Like, how do I know when there's a new thing and how do I quickly upgrade to avoid um, avoid introducing that problem into my code? So mm -hmm. that's, that's how I like to think about open source security. And I I super appreciate those tools that help devs go, hey, there's a new version. Here's how you can upgrade. And also make sure you run through all your unit tests and function tests and all the other good testing that you already have. So to add to that, if the company is following DevSecOps practices like we are talking about now, right? So version control, continuous integration, continuous delivery, you have infrastructure as code, you have monitoring and logging, and then you also have the continuous collaboration and communication, then you upgrade it, uh, you, you do a pull request, you patch it, you upgrade it, push it, 
and then you have it up in production, right? So I think following those practices that we preach within each organization is going to take them a long way into deploying secure software, right? Uh, whether it's coming from the internal applications or whether it's coming from open source components that they are using. Yes. And we also need to remember that just, you know, we're describing it like it's super easy. Yeah, just open a pull request and then merge it and then everything will be OK. But uh, developers are not so happy to do that. Right. They are afraid that their application will break or something will happen. They have to do so much testing in order to verify that it will really works. Um, and this is part of the reasons why they like hate <laughs> when we tell them, you know, there is uh, a security issue in this and that version. And now you have to upgrade it to a new major version because you didn't keep your keep your versions up to date. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're actually really debated like that question so much because, you know, as someone who cares about security, I want everyone to have the latest version. Um, but that's not a very easy thing to do. So we also need to remember that. And there are some tools that help with that as well. Good point. So we have a question that came in from Soraka. I thought I'd throw it out to you guys. Uh, usually in an enterprise, we do not get enough security experts to join every scrum team. So will upskilling developers on security aspects, uh, is that a more practical approach to DevSecOps? And it kind of goes back to an earlier conversation we were having, but I think it's an important question to ask. Anybody? Go ahead, Scott. I, yeah, I got a strong opinion about this one. Okay. <laughs> you have many strong opinions, Scott. I do That's have why many. I like you. Today, today I'm on fire, too. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, Dave, no. Dave's going, uh, Scott's rant, and I'm like, uh-oh. Uh, apparently, I'm on fire. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I always liken this to when the exec team goes, hey, the FP&A team, uh, I, need, I need to know something about the business. I need to know if we change prices, how that affects top line, bottom line. The FP&A team doesn't go, let me go teach you about the GL for a while. Lots of people know about the GL, but that's not their first stop, right? They don't, they don't instantly go, hey, let's look at a spreadsheet and look at all these sweet formulas I put in here. And this is how this whole thing. What they do is go, here's a tool. You can change a thing and it does the rest of it for you. We need to do better jobs of doing that. And that's how we'll more effectively scale into DevSecOps is by giving people simple, effective tools to make decisions. Instead of trying to teach them how to do our job, that's not what they're there to do. They want to do their job. Let's give right. them information to be able to do their job. That's my that's my short rant, Dave. For <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're getting it, called out, Dave. No, I, I agree. I agree <laughs> with your rant on DevSecOps. It, it, it is, and I'm. I mean, that's why I'm waiting for like the really cool um, developer friendly threat modeling tool to come out, right? That that isn't a super complicated Visio diagram or, you know, six ways to Sunday, every threat vector kind of thing. Because I think so much of it is just awareness, right? I don't know what I don't know. And so being able to have something that says, hey, you might want to think about this, right? It's, you know, it, we, we jokingly talk about the spell check space here, right? Where, um, you know, if we're trying to give developers this insight as they're coding, right? This notion, like, I don't want a return to Clippy, you know, and that kind of stuff, right? I don't need something popping up that goes, hey, it looks like you've got a vulnerability here, right? Like, you just need something contextual that, that helps us. And, and again, in so many ways, it's, it's like, where we saw DevOps in the early days that if I made a change, I wanted to know how it impacted production and did that feature work. And if I had to wait a week to find out, I it's not like I sat around for a week waiting on that and didn't do anything. So being able to provide security and context, I think Scott's spot on. If we can do stuff there that makes it simple and easy for them to to deal with it right in the moment, then that's that's a huge win in getting those practices moving forward. Exactly. And I think you mentioned something super important, which is like the disruption, right? We disrupt, yeah. disrupt them with, you have a security vulnerability. And it's like when I have like this Windows update and it tells me you have a critical security vulnerability or a cute critical security issue, you need to reboot your 
uh, your computer in 10, <laughs> 9, 8. I'm not like, oh, exactly. thank you, Windows. Thank you yeah. for protecting me. I'm like, no, no, not now, please. So this yeah. is very similar. I'm presenting. How, <laughs> this is very similar to how developers get it, right? They get like, okay, I have a security yeah. vulnerability. I need to handle it now. It's disrupting me to do my job. So how do we actually make security tools that, you know, they are they are integrated into their day-to-day -day workflows and day-to-day -day job. Good point. And I think, um, you know, to, to Rob's point, I, I think sometimes when maybe organizations ask their developers to take a greater role in security, I think it's kind of a deer in the headlights thing because, because security or developers know how to develop they don't really know security and 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 that is changing but i think you know you, you're you're yeah, unless you tell them well i'm not actually asking you to like go and like implement a, a new you know software firewall or anything like that i just want you to you know increase your awareness of what needs to happen with the application and uh, and here are some tools and technologies that are going to help you do that. Don't tell them that they have to learn security. Tell them that they're going to have tools to help them make their application more secure. And I wonder if there's some sort of uh, disconnect in, in the way that uh, organizations are going about explaining to developers, you know, exactly what their role is going to be in DevSecOps. Dave, you look perplexed. <laughs> No, no, I was I was thinking of all the good tools that developers have at their expose, disposal for like security. If you just think about IDEs, that's where the developers typically live, right? And um, and so I've I've seen a lot of companies, a lot of vendors push and even Red Hat push security information data to the IDE. We were talking about open source and um, looking at dependencies. If if you know, there's tools out there that as developers are typing and bringing in uh, dependencies or defining their declaration files, like a palm file, um, that I, the IDE plugin will tell them, well, this version is vulnerable. So you might want to think about a different version. So even before they get to CI CD, they'll, they'll be coding securely. That'll obviously lessen the amount of time they have to go back and do a rework. Um, but no, I, I was looking perplexed because I'm agreeing with you and trying to formulate a Articular response. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I didn't mean to good. jump the gun there. So, but uh, does anybody? Um, I, you know, we, we have nine minutes left to the end of this webinar. We time flies when you're having fun. One mm -hmm. more question that I want to throw out to you guys, but before I do, I just want to make sure that nobody else has any comments regarding that. I think I think Dave's point about like trying to feed stuff into the IDE and don't make a CI/CD black box test. Right. Which you can't reproduce locally. Yeah. Like if I want to commit code to a repository and push it in the CI CD, I want to be able to confidently know that it's not going to blow up when it gets there by running that same kind of testing stuff yep. locally. I want the ability to do that. Uh, whether or not I do it every time is a different story because I don't run all my unit tests. I might run a unit test for a thing, but I want to be able to know as a developer, when I push this code, I'm confident that CI CD is not going to explode. Uh, and, Black box testing in CI kind of doesn't do that very well. Mm -hmm. So as I said, we have, well, now we're down to eight minutes. So I want to throw the last question out. And, and Scott, since um, you've been on fire today, I'm going to throw this one at, at you. Um, and that is uh, this, this whole idea of uh, proactive versus reactive um, and how can organizations actually adopt a much more proactive application security stance? Um, is it something that is easily achievable or are we going to keep having these conversations for the next five years or so? I, I totally think it's achievable, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. And we've talked about a lot of the things in this webinar today that go into that, like being, if there's a, uh, if there is a security team, being a good partner to development and product teams to help them solve the problems that they're trying to solve and do that in a sane way, deliver great tools that give them information to make decisions. Um, let them control some of that tool decisioning. Like don't just go, here's the tool you're going to use. Go, Hey, I want you to go look at some tools that do this kinds of thing. Um, I think it's doable. You it's just going to take, it takes a lot of work, right? Especially in a, 
an enterprise that's been around for a long time that does things a very certain way, it's going to take a little like, we got to go proof of concept this within the organization and then spread it out from there. And don't, don't big bang it. Big bang security doesn't work on anything. <laughs> No, I, th I think if I want, if I may add, if unless organizations treat security issues same way they treat quality issues, uh, because in most organizations, they have a completely separate defect tracking, JIRA or whatnot for security issues. Now, you are building that silo now because you are telling your developers the quality issues go in this place. You have to fix everything, but the security issues go here. We need to look at that. So... As security professionals and as companies, we are ourselves not confident about the issues that we want developers to fix, right? So unless we we break down all those barriers that we ourselves are creating, I don't think we will go to the next uh, stage, whatever it is in this uh, industry as security professionals, right? So I, I always talk about that, whether I speak in webinars or with my customers, treat them equally right so i think that is the biggest uh place yeah. where we can improve yeah yeah i agree i think security is a quality metric right it's part of yeah. the the conversation it's every bit as important and when we can make that conversation happen um, it's interesting, too, because we're starting to see QA teams getting involved in security testing in small bits, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's interactive or monitoring and stuff like that. Um, so it's it really is propagating through all parts of the, the pipeline and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm right there with you. I think you have to have the quality discussion with it. And I think for some people that helps them connect the dots to business value and why it's important and, and those kinds of things, too. Yeah, I definitely agree. So again, I need to, I think we need to think about risk, right? Quality is is some uh, is one kind of risk and security is a different kind of risk to your business. Yep. Um so that makes a lot of sense when you think about it this way. Um maybe to summarize, so I think that we touched a lot of things um today in the webinar, but two things that I think are maybe good takeaways. The first one is that applications are changing. And in order to be a good security person or a good security team, you need to learn those new technologies and you need to be familiar with them in order to know how to protect and mitigate them. Um, and the second thing is, again, and I'm with Scott here, like, you know, go with your engineering team, go with the R&D team, um, make sure that you have security not by like disruption and something that you need to do because you have to um it needs to be part of your integrated holistic like day-to-day -day work so those are my uh takeaways awesome you're, you're with team scott is that what you were team saying scott <laughs> no i think we're all on the same same team right like one thing that i think is consistent in what we've been talking about today is is it involves a culture change and it's not going to be easy and i think about that involves changing behavior right changing behavior is hard i've got four teenagers now it's almost impossible mm. but to do it for professionals it's it, who are kind of set in their ways it's it's a little bit more difficult and, uh, and there's various ways you can do it. One thing that sticks out in my head is accountability. And that goes to defining appropriate metrics um, that you can provide positive reinforcement to, which is probably better rather than negative reinforcement, right? So mm -hmm. you can look to things like the DORA metrics, the DevOps uh, research assessment team by Google, their metrics on DevOps and things like time to fix production issues, but you can add some security flavor into that as well and have everybody share in those metrics and then report on them, right? And so they're accountable. That tends to help change behavior and change the culture. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have two minutes to the top of the hour. So unfortunately, we're gonna have to stop it here, folks. What great comments. I do appreciate you guys, uh, your expertise and uh, everything that uh, you guys bring to the DevSecOps table. I, I do appreciate and I, I was going, I was watching the public chat and it was like Scott on fire. So uh, I do encourage you guys, if you haven't had a chance real quick to just, you know, scroll through that chat and, and take a look at some of the comments from the audience. Cause I know we didn't get to them all.
Uh, just a quick reminder that today's event has been recorded. Yay. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you will have the opportunity to do so. Following uh, the webinar today, we are going to be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to live on the DevOps.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars and look in the on demand section and should be right there waiting for you. All right, before we close things out, and I say thank you and good night, uh, I do want to do the drawing for the four twenty-five dollar Amazon gift cards. But without further ado, let's go ahead and do that. Our first winner today is Eric T. Congratulations, Eric. Eric. Our second, yay! Our second winner is Tim P. Congratulations, Tim. Tim. Yay! Tim. Our third winner today is. See, this is my favorite part of a panel discussion because everybody gets involved in the yay. So, yay. Actually, our third winner is Sarath S. Congratulations, Sarath. Tim. And our final winner. Here we go, guys. Is uh, Teraslav S. Congratulations to yay. all four of you. Guys. Yay! We're we're going to be following up with you guys. Uh, via email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't awesome. see anything there, please check your spam folder. Mira, Dave, Rob, Cherie, Scott, what a great conversation. So much fun. Always a pleasure having you guys on the webinars. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. your expertise with the audience today. And uh, I, I just enjoyed the heck out of today. So I appreciate it again. And I also... So I do want to thank you guys, and but I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. And I know we're right up at the top of the hour, so I'm just going to make this short. Thanks, everybody. Really do appreciate it. And I hope to see you guys again on a future webinar. Until then, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. And please, whatever you do, stay safe. Thanks. Yes, everybody. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thanks for having us.